Apple Studio Display, there's a lot to talk about, and I'll be approaching this from a very different perspective than many of the other reviews that you have seen. So let's go, this is Artist Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. There are a few things I'd like to share before we get into this. First, I'll be approaching this from a photographer perspective. I am a wedding events and commercial photographer, and I print my work through my inkjet printers that I have in the studio. I also sent my work out to the lab for printing and create albums for my client. Color accuracy and also the color gamut coverage for the display in the one that I want to use is definitely of paramount importance. I also do YouTube videos, but every time I export these YouTube video out, they're in Rec. 709. Most of the display out there can cover Rec. 709 color space just fine, so it's less of a concern for me. If you're unaware, I'm also BenQ Global Ambassador for their Pro Display lineup. If I do need to make a recommendation for a display, I'll be referring to BenQ SW line, which are 99% Adobe RGB coverage display with hardware calibration created for photographers, or BenQ PD line, which is part of their Pro Display lineup. But overall, this video is not going to be a comparison between most of these other displays. However, it's really more of an educate and inform so that you're aware of what you're really getting into. And if you're a photographer and you do printing, well, this is definitely going to be the video for you. And with this, I ask that you listen with an open mind and also keep your comments kind and cordial. I might share with you a workflow that you may have not used or heard of before. However, that does not mean that a photographer does not use that workflow or the workflow does not exist. This being said, I own a lot of Apple products and I am a big Apple fan. In fact, I probably own at least one product in many of the Apple product categories that they have to offer. But what it comes down to at the end of the day for me in my daily work, in the things I use on a daily basis is that I will choose the best product for the job. Now, if Apple products does not fall into that category, that's perfectly okay with me too. As long as the product is going to help me accomplish what I want to do, brand comes secondary to the functionality of the product. We're going to talk a lot about specs and we're also going to be looking at this beyond the spec as well. So let's go. At the core of Apple Studio Displays are a series of questions you have to ask yourself as a creative professional. What is most important to you? Is it color accuracy and working in the color gamut that you need? Is it the overall design of the display or the fact that it has a webcam with a studio array built in? There are a lot of things that this display have. And there are many components in this display that when you look at other displays out there in the market, they shared similar components, but rarely are you going to find one that has all of this package together in this really nice design. In a way, the sum of all its parts for the Apple Studio display is great in a whole. But even with that said, there are certain areas where the Apple Studio display does not excel, especially if you're a photographer and you do printing. And I'm going to outline all of those for you. Let's start with the specification. This is a 27 inch 5K display, 5120 by 2880 pixels at 218 pixels per inch. Yes, in that line, in that sentence, there was a lot of specs that we covered, but let's break this down a little bit. So here's the question. As a photographer, do you need a 5K, 6K, let alone a 4K display? The answer, it all depends. What it really comes down to is what you need and what you're really looking for. But for instance, let's have a look at this. This is a Nikon D850 file that is 45 megapixel. And if you have a 4K display, you zoom in 100%, you're seeing that now. 5K and 6K will show you a little bit more, but none of them will show you 100%. And you're still seeing the pixels being represented in a very similar fashion to a low res display. You're just seeing a little bit less of the picture when you zoom in. If you want to see the whole thing, you have to zoom out to which everything would get scaled down anyway. You're always going to be looking at the scaled down image. So if you have to think about things in this perspective, you may not necessarily need a higher resolution display, unless you pixel peep, of course. But this being said, let's talk about another side effect of having a higher resolution display. In macOS, it scales the resolution for the entire operating system. Meaning that for a 5K display, you're not really just pushing 5K out when you're running scale resolution. A lot of times you're pushing more than that out, 60 times per second, because these displays refresh at 60 Hertz. And there's really no variable refresh rate or anything like that on these displays. So you're pushing your graphic card to work that much harder. 
Case in point, take Lightroom Classic, the program that many pros use in their daily workflow. When you work in Lightroom and run it on the scale resolution, you may notice that sometimes Lightroom does lag or it takes a while for it to generate the effect and everything. That's because it takes that much more power to really push all those things out. Now, speaking of which, Lightroom is not necessarily the most optimized program, but that's another story for another time. So you can see the downside to having a higher resolution display running in scale. MacOS implements scaling different than Windows, where Windows scale the interface, MacOS scale the entire operating system, the entire graphical interface that you see. This has its up and downs, and both of them have their plus and minuses. None of them are actually better than the other. It's just a different implementation. And if you're stuck into this operating system, there's really not that many ways that you can go and change the way how the OS behave. And if you're unfamiliar with scaling, it is like pixel binning for display. Depending on the resolution that you choose for scaling, multiple pixels are grouped together to represent that one original pixel. The end result is that you see lines that are much sharper and also much crisper and in general, smoother to the eyes. Now, this also comes at the downside of the overall screen real estate because you're no longer using that original native pixels for the display anymore. This being said, in order for a display to qualify as what Apple call Retina or in PC world, they call HD DPI, you generally want to have a display with a pixel density of more than 200 pixels per inch. Most of the other displays on the market right now, unless they are five or 6K in certain sizes, does not really come close to this number. For instance, take a 27 inch 4K display. You're looking at around 163 pixels per inch for the density. Going down a little bit further, let's say you go to a 24 inch display that is 4K, you're looking at 184 pixels per inch. It does not yet quite cross that 200 pixels per inch threshold. The downside to this, some may say that the image looks blurry to the eyes. And the best thing that I can tell you right now is that you should probably try and find a place where you can go and see this yourself because it is one that is really tuned to an individual perception and is really hard to see. Some have no problem at all scaling 4K. Some will say, well, 4K doesn't work quite well for them because they constantly pixel peep. So scaling means that your GPU have to work harder to push more data out 60 times per second. In fact, when you're running at scaling, your GPU is working much harder to generate all these extra data compared to even when you're running at native resolution. This being said, you may want to get something that is 4K or higher if you, for instance, work a lot with video in 4K or shoot in a higher resolution and you want to see the playback at 100% without any scale down effect whatsoever on the video clip. Scaling is necessary for these higher resolution displays because if you run them at native resolution, the text and everything else on the display will be extremely small. This can cause your eyes to strain really quickly when you're using the display. In fact, macOS scales higher resolution displays by default. For instance, when you first link up a 27 inch 4K or a 32 inch one, macOS will automatically scale this display down to around 1080 equivalent. You can certainly change this afterwards and some will change it to a 2K equivalent. To which if you're doing that, you're really pushing your GPU that much harder. And yes, even though these newer computers, especially with the M1 chip can handle it just fine, at the end of the day, wouldn't you be better off getting a display that can run 2K native without having to do any type of scaling and you can see very clearly on the display still? All the while, the benefit of that would be the program that are not optimized are going to run snappier. That's just one perspective to think about. Apple Studio Display have a peak brightness of 600 nits, which is pretty much in line with other pseudo HDR displays that uses a similar IPS LED backlight technology. This said, is it necessary to have this for content creation? It all depends. For photography, especially if you do printing, I would say no, because most of the time, you're going to calibrate your display to anywhere between 80 to 120 nits, meaning that you're running the display at 1 6 brightness the entire time you're doing your pro workflow. And I would also argue that if you are a photographer and you are not printing now, you may print in the future, and it's not a bad idea to calibrate your display to the lower nits brightness because a few reasons. Number one, if you sent your print out in the future, should that need ever arise? Well, you don't have to come back and re-edit it again or change the brightness. Secondly, when you're working it that way, 
anything that you edit on these darker displays will look amazing on brighter ones. However, the other way around does not generally apply. And sometimes when you edit on a brighter display, the colors doesn't pop quite as much or it doesn't look quite as good on dimmer displays. And yes, there are other people that are using dimmer displays out there in the market. So not everyone is really using these displays with peak brightness all the time. Now for video creation, you may ask, is this necessary? Well, if you're doing video for clients or uploading to YouTube in standard dynamic range, Rec. 709, probably not so much. If you're mastering your content in HDR, I would say there are some benefits, but you're still doing a Zudo HDR with a max peak brightness of 600 nits. That I would argue if you want to get the best display to master your content in HDR without breaking the budget, look at the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro with the liquid Retina XDR display. Those are the mini LEDs because the screen can go to as bright as 1000 nits sustain and a peak brightness of 1600 nits. And those are really amazing to do HDR work in. And you're really seeing everything in true HDR, not the scaled down HDR version. Overall, I will say that this display is really great for HDR content consumption, but beyond that, I would probably just skip this display for those type of creative work. This display also has True Tone technology. However, if you're doing any type of color critical work, you should definitely disable True Tone. Here's why. With True Tone technology, Apple is using the camera or the webcam to constantly sense and monitor the color temperature of the environment and it's changing your display white point in real time to match that of the environment. This is helping you avoid seeing like the blue displays in a very warm room, for instance. However, this is not really great for color accuracy because if your display white point is constantly changing, well, you're really trying to adjust the color to a moving target. So my recommendation is to disable that. If you have purchased an Apple device, I would say in the past six to seven years, True Tone has been in all of those devices, especially one that has a built-in display. With the Apple Display Studio, True Tone is really coming to desktop Mac for the very first time because now you have a display that has a built-in webcam that can sense the color environment. One more thing I also want to add as well is that if your Mac has the capability to do True Tone, it will also affect external displays linking to those Mac as well. So it's, it's not only going to adjust the built-in display, it will also adjust any external display link up to the system. So if you're doing any color critical work, I highly recommend going in to disable True Tone. When it comes to this display for calibration, disable True Tone and also I recommend going in to set the different reference mode that you want to use before you run the calibration process. I will also have a guide on how to calibrate this display coming up really soon on the channel as well. This display is a firm shift in Apple Pro Display color management philosophy. Like the Apple Pro Display XDR and Apple Liquid Retina XDR display inside the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro, you can go in and choose the different reference mode you want to use. You can customize it and also do white point fine tune. But in that dialogue, you will never see a location where you can change the ICC profile. The only place where you can do that is in Color Sync Utility. This is really noting a big change in color management philosophy where Apple believes most users do not and should not go in to calibrate the display relying heavily on a closed loop calibration system that is done from the factory. Overall, there may be some margin of errors between the color output from one Mac to the next, but this is determined by Apple to be within the acceptable range. I always praise Apple for their display calibration, and I genuinely believe that doing it this way is going to be great for general use, but this does leave a lot to be desired if you're a photographer and especially one who prints. The Studio Display Reference Mode, like the XDR variety, acts like a pseudo hardware calibrated display, one with a fixed lookup table or a LUT. In general, with a hardware calibrated display, you will run a proprietary software, calibrate the display, and the software would then make the color adjustment on the panel level. Essentially, it is writing the rewritable 3D LUT. On this display, however, because Apple closed out all the calibration, really, you're really choosing the pre-calibrated value store from the display. But the reason why I say this really acts like a pseudo hardware calibrated display is because you can go in and customize a reference mode. You can choose different color gamut, different gamma response curve, and also the displays know the brightness level that it has to be at in order to correspond to the correct output. This is somewhat in between a hardware calibrated display and a software calibrated display in general. 
In a way, Apple have moved a color mode that you would normally access on the display from other non-Apple display into the software that you change via macOS. And because Apple Ethos is for you not to go in and calibrate the display anyway, because it's done very well from the factory already, this is another reason why this display panel is not hardware calibration capable. And just because you are using, for instance, a color perimeter or a color spectral photometer to run the calibration on the display, and yes, even though it is a hardware, that is not necessarily a true hardware calibration. I'll leave a link to the video in the description below that explains the difference between software and hardware calibration on display panels. Now let's talk about the display glass. The one I got is what Apple called the anti-reflective coating or the glossy glass panel. The reason why I got this model in the studio or I ordered this one is because this is the one that most of you are going to get. However, you can see right now that as I'm starting to angle this towards the light, it is reflecting all the light that I have in the studio. So if you're working in a brighter environment with a lot of reflections and your studio may not be as well lighting control, I would highly encourage you to go in and spend the extra money to upgrade to the nano texture etching, which is going to make that display look very similar to this BenQ PD3220U. One of the things I will also say is that on other third-party pro displays, it comes with a matte coating standard. You don't have to go in and pay for the upgrade to get the matte coating. So if you care about that, I would say definitely look at other alternative. Now, this being said, I also want to mention that if you choose the glossy anti-reflective coating version, this display has a couple of inherent characteristics that you should be aware of. The number one thing is that it has much more contrast than a matted display. It will also show your color vibrant, much more saturated than the matted display counterpart. So a lot of times when people compare the picture between the two, they generally prefer the way how the picture would come out on a glossy display because it's definitely more flattering. Think walking into an electronic store that sells TVs and monitors. They tune everything all the way up. It is not necessarily something that you would use in real life, but that is what they do to be the attention grabber. Now, getting the nano texture etching option, if you want to go with an Apple Studio display or any other matte display for that matter, is going to give you a couple benefits. For instance, if you're editing a picture and it doesn't look quite as good on a matte display, well, it's okay. What that is really telling you is that you can go in and do more edit, do more enhancement to make that image look better. And the moment you get that image to look good on a matte display, it's going to look fantastic on a glossy one. That philosophy, however, doesn't really go the other way around because everything looks amazing or flattering on these glossy display already. So there's less incentive for you to go in and do more work. However, in the moment you compare this to a matte display, you will notice that your work doesn't pop quite as much. So there are other advantages in getting a matte display or the one with nano texture etching as well. And now we have a talk about the color gamut, which is P3. This is where you really have to think about the color gamut that you want to use in your creative workflow. This is a software calibrated display, and yes, it has advanced color control, but if the display has not been calibrated in, for example, Adobe RGB from the factory, especially for these software calibrated ones, you can't really access that. And even if you go into color sync utility and you set the ICC profile to the reference Adobe RGB, it does not mean that you are going to get Adobe RGB color coverage from this panel. Before we go deeper into color gamut coverage, let's quickly take a look at Apple Creative Audience trajectory. They have always focused on the video segment. For instance, take their iPhone, iPad. Those ship on the device have always been able to encode video much faster than they can on Intel. And that means the screen on those devices has also been optimized for video as well in the color gamut that is used for all these motion capture. Granted, yes, Apple does stand for photography on their iPhones, but Apple understands really well that photographers who print generally represents a niche within a niche. That means we are an extremely small population. So if you are using these screens to do video, this is perfect. If you're using these screens to do content for stills on the web only, this is great. However, if you do print, well, we have been definitely left out of the equation. So let's first address the larger photographer's population. If you do work for web only and for content consumption on displays, do you need a 99% Adobe RGB coverage displays? Probably not. Will this display work fine for what you do? Absolutely. 
If you are a photographer who prints and believe that Apple Display has been matching with your prints just fine, don't let me convince you otherwise. There is really no point. Continue to do what you do. However, if you're a little bit more open to just hearing my arguments, let me share with you some thoughts why you may want to consider a display that can show 99% Adobe RGB as a photographer. First, you can't see color that your display gamut can't show. For instance, if you take a look at this comparison between P3 and Adobe RGB, there's an area of about 14%, if not more, colors that are not overlapping. And Adobe RGB is definitely the larger color space. So when you really try to capture a picture from your camera in Adobe RGB, chances are your camera may be able to capture even more colors than what is defined in Adobe RGB color gamut. If you open this picture up on the display with P3 color space, through rendering intent, the colors that are out of gamut from the P3 display will get remapped so that it fits within the gamut. However, what you're not seeing at all are all these colors that you may capture that are in the Adobe RGB color gamut and you'll never see them again. Now, if you're really doing your work only for web and for print display consumption, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. However, as photographers, you never know when you're going to print and I always advocate that you should work with your images in the larger color space possible so that down the road, should your need ever arise, you're covered and you don't have to worry about seeing another color that you haven't seen before or trying to find a display that can cover the gamut that you want for printing. And yes, some of you may argue that the standard color for web right now is sRGB and that's definitely true. And in the future, this will probably change into DCI-P3. So you wonder what you may be missing here. Well, let me put it this way. If you're looking for a display now and at the price point as comparable with each other, if you end up getting a photography specific display, you can do your image edit in Adobe RGB and those displays generally have a high coverage for DCI and P3 color space as well. So you can calibrate those displays into a different color gamut and be able to use both. In a way, the way how I see it is that Having a photography specific display is a win-win scenario. Whereas if you get this display, you're just stuck in P3 color space. And if you're okay with that, like I said, don't let me convince you otherwise, but I'm just giving you some food for thoughts. One of the things I will always say is that it's easier to go from a larger color gamut that you can see all the colors that you have captured down to a smaller one. So Adobe RGB into sRGB into display P3 is fine, but you can't really go in and see the colors that cannot be showed on the display. So for some of you, you're gonna be absolutely okay with this. For others, you're going to know that there are certain greens, certain yellow tones, certain orange tones that will never be able to reproduce faithfully on these DCI P3s display. Some of you may wonder why I put so much emphasis on Adobe RGB. Simply enough, it's because I print. And even if I don't, I still prefer to edit my images in the largest color gamut possible that's aligned to the way how my images are captured. Some will also argue that the paper color gamut is not that large and many of them don't exceed sRGB. Though that may be true, there are newer printers, paper, ink, and combination of those that enables now color gamut in certain areas to exceed sRGB. And for some specific paper, you can get some areas that are exceeding what DCI P3 can show. And having an Adobe RGB is definitely going to be a benefit in that area. And considering the price point between a pro photography display and the Apple Studio display, if they're really close to each other, I would tend to lean more towards a pro photography display because it gives me the benefit of both worlds, Adobe RGB and P3. There are a few more bits about this display that I like to share. One being that it is a 10-bit display, but it is done via an 8-bit plus FRC. If you're unfamiliar with 8-bit plus FRC, majority of the colors is handled over the 8-bit signal and the rest of the colors that makes us see the billion colors is done via a dittering process or a frame rate control. In layman terms, some of the pixels are changing at different frequencies, making us believe that we're seeing those billion pixels. This is the same implementation with majority of the other displays out there with only a few handful of panels that are really true 10-bit that are in the market today. In addition, this displays only refresh at 60 Hertz or only up to 60 Hertz at the highest. It does not have 120 Hertz promotion or anything like that at all. And a few more last bit about Apple Studio Display is that it does have two fan inside the display. So when you're running it, there is going to be fans that runs and 
have hot air come out at the very top of it. Although you're not really going to hear the fan on this display quite as much as what you would hear in an M1 Max Max Studio. Let's now talk about design and ergonomics. Being that this is an Apple product, the design is bar none one of the best out there. And there are very few other manufacturers that can come close to what Apple has to offer. But this said, this is where your priority has to come in. Are you looking for a display that will show your creative content in the color gamut that it was intended to be seen with great color accuracy? Or are you looking for a display that has good color accuracy, not necessarily the right gamut, but a really sleek design? If you're looking for the latter, this display is definitely the one for you. However, if you're looking for the former, I think there are better options that are out there on the market that is better suited for your creative needs. Now let's talk about the stand. At least it is included and does not cost $1,000 extra. You have three options to choose from and you should definitely choose wisely because it is not a user serviceable part, meaning that if you want to change this down the road, you have to take the display into Apple for them to change it out for you. There is definitely going to be a cost involved in that. It offers not so much of a flexibility and definitely a lot of inconvenience and price factor down the road as well. With these three options, only one of them will allow you to change your display between a horizontal and a vertical orientation. And if you want that, you should choose the vase mount option to which you would then use your own mounting option or stand depending on what you want to use it with. There are other two stands that comes with the display that you can choose as an option. The included one is the tilt stand, which is what I have right now. This behaves very similarly to a 24 inch iMac. And overall, I would say that this is the model that I got and I don't really like it that much because I can't bring the display higher or lower, which when I'm doing videos like this is something that I use a lot. And it's also something that I use when I'm setting these display on a desk as well. So rather than changing the height of my chair or the height of my desk or whatever that may be, I want the display to be independent of those and having a display that can go higher or lower is definitely a really good flexible option. This is where the secondary option comes in and this stand does cost around $300 extra. This is the height adjustable one. So the height adjustable one is really great. It acts very similar to the Apple Pro Display XDR stand. It is zero gravity, so you don't feel like the display is weighing that much at all. And when it moves, something to remember is that it moves in an arc. So at the top and the bottom is the most recessed. When you're in the middle, it does come out. So it does go in an arc like that. If you don't want your display to come closer to you, that may not necessarily be the option or the display distance between you and the display to change. However, if I have to go and configure this out for myself, for my own personal use, I would personally go with the height adjustable stand because that gives me more flexibility. I would also go in and configure this with the nano texture etching options so that it minimizes the reflection in the environment. And when we add all those costs together for the upgrade, we're looking at a display that is $2,300 for a 27 inch 5K. Even for a display where the sum of its parts is greater than a whole, it is still a very pricey display. And I believe there are other options that would come really close to what this has to offer out there. Here are some other aspects that this display has and other may lack. An 813 chip running iOS with 64 gigabytes of memory on board. That is quite hefty when you think that this is only a display, but it has that much memory. Where Apple can take this down the road, we'll never know, but hopefully we'll find out sooner than later. Beyond that, you have multiple other things that is included. For example, a 12 megapixel webcam that sent its image signal processing through the 813 chip. Now, the only downside of that right now is that the image quality is not quite as good, but you do get center stage. So if you have a video conference thing that you're doing a lot, center stage is definitely going to come in really handy. It also has a microphone array on there that is studio quality mic, which allows you to invoke Siri when you link this up to an older Mac and also have video conferences if you do that a lot and you want to display that is an all-in-one package. In addition, it also has six speakers. And let me put it this way. There are no other displays out there that has speaker built in that will beat the sound quality of these speakers and also pack in one crucial feature that Apple has, which is spatial audio. So overall, if you ask me, I think this is a really neat package that other displays would have a hard time matching up to. And a few more thoughts I'd like to add to this too is that to get these awesome package, what Apple is really considering is the current computer they're selling today and also some into the future. 
they're not really as concerned with really old Macs or for example, PC for that matter. If it happens to work with those machines, that's great, but that is not their main priority. Their main priority is create the best product going forward for them. This is something different that third party display manufacturers have to really consider the broad ramification for hardware that can span across decades, for instance, and also one that has to support both Mac and PC in various configurations. So Apple can definitely go out and create a display that has really nice, elegant one cable connector where other display manufacturers would have to include all the other type of connection in order to guarantee broad compatibility and not alienate their customer base. So you have to ask yourself, what is your creative discipline and what are your color gamuts and workflow needs? If this display was around a decade ago, even when compared to pro photography display, I would say that it is a compelling option. Back then we have two, Azo, which sits at the very top, the best quality and also commands an exorbitant price point. The one that follows right behind is NEC and it is relatively more affordable compared to the Azo variety. But that said, where we are today, there are so many different great display options for photographers. For instance, take BenQ SW display line. With multiple models in a lineup that is suited for different budget price point and also workflow, any model that you buy will get you 99% Adobe RGB coverage, a hardware calibration capability, shading hood, amazing uniformity, and you can also use other color gamuts such as P3 with the display as well, not just only P3 or Adobe RGB. So you really have to ask yourself, what is your priority in a display? And what are you really looking to get this display for? Here are a few more things to consider when you're choosing a display. I always see posts on various forums asking for display advice. And one of the criteria is always, I want color accuracy. More so than just looking at color accuracy, I would highly encourage you to expand the scope and look at the color gamut as well. Because even if you have high color accuracy in a gamut that you don't need, it doesn't really do you much good for your workflow. The other thing, speaking of color accuracy and gamut is that if you look at Apple spec sheet for their display, none of them would ever list a percentage coverage of the PC3 color space. And the whole reason for this is because they only really just make one display model or that is the display that is included with the device. You don't have an option to go and choose a different model or ideally another manufacturer. And that's the reason why they don't list all those specs together. Based on my testing for this display, I would say that the coverage is probably around 98% P3 color space, which is good. But if you're looking at Adobe RGB, the coverage does drop down into like the 80th percentile and not necessarily in the 90th percentile anymore. So those are the things that you definitely want to consider. The other thing that I hear a lot of people talking about, I want to get an Apple display because it has greater compatibility. I think that we need to start to look at Apple displays or Apple computers as what they are, a tool that we use. And even though Apple may change to an M1 where the underpinning is different than a PC now, the overall philosophy of the computer is still the same. You still have graphic output. And at the end of the day, the graphic port on these computers are still doing the same fundamental job. They're outputting signal to the display. So yes, you may have more controls when you link things up to Apple, things are integrated better, but compatibility wise between this and any other third party displays, in my testing, it has been really great now. Let me put it simply this way. In the early days of M1, there were numerous display compatibility issues. And that's happening because M1 is entirely a new ship, new architecture, and a great departure from Intel. Fast forward to today, we are a year and a half into the transition. Majority of these display manufacturers had enough time already to release firmware updates, software fixes, and bring their display to full compatibility with these new M1 computers. In fact, in my testing, beside a very few issues here and there, which doesn't necessarily impede the functionality of the display, which is to show pictures, you can use any display with these M1 computers without any issues. This being said, if you're looking for a fully integrated system that you can use software to control everything and due to color mode changes, then this display may be the one for you. However, if you're a photographer and you're like me, a niche within a niche who prints, then I think there are other display out there on the market that will represent a much better value for what you're going to spend than to go get an Apple Studio display. 
And this said, I also want to add in one last thought, and that is some people believe that editing on these Apple displays, it's going to help their image look the same on Apple portable devices. The premise of this is to a certain extent, yes, but most of the time it's going to be no. And the reason why is because all these Apple portable devices use a different display backlight technology. Some of them are OLED, some of them are just regular LCD, some of them are mini LED. This will change the characteristic of light output. As good as Apple have calibrated their display, they're never 100% match. Not to mention that on Apple devices, there's true tone, there's different brightness level that someone can choose. And a user, if you take, for example, 10 phones or 10 tablets, line them up together, each one of them are going to have their settings slightly different. So it's going to be very difficult to match the colors on those displays. And the other thing I also want us to encourage as well is that the moment we upload our images online or share our content online, it's being viewed by everyone around the world. And if you're in the US, yes, there are a higher concentration of Apple devices, but if you go to a foreign country, there's less of those and all those phone screens that are being used in other territories around the world shows different color gamuts on the display altogether, including some iPhone screens, which may have their phone screen replaced with a lower quality display. So it's really hard to guarantee that editing on here is going to make an image look better on a portable device. And if you're really concentrated on that, I would say don't worry about those too much because you're trying to open a can of worm that you can't close. Anyway, I hope that you find all these thoughts about the Apple Studio display helpful. Like I said, this is approaching this from a photography standpoint, one who prints his work. If you genuinely believe that this is going to be the best display for you, I'm not trying to convince you otherwise. I'm just trying to educate and inform all of you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Give this a like, subscribe and hit the bell you new, and remember, in art we trust.